Welcome to 10, the Tenant Experience Network podcast. I'm your host, David Abrams. And in each episode, we bring you conversations with leading CRE industry professionals and experts who all have something to say about tenant experience and the future of the workplace. Today, we're connecting with Ivo Van Bruckelen, managing partner of the PropTech Connection. Ivo and his team are tracking an impressive 19,000 PropTech companies to provide global market intelligence and insights on what's happening in the industry. Keep listening to learn more about their data-led approach and Evo's passion for innovation in the built world. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Let's get started. And now I'd like to welcome Evo to the show. I'm really glad you could be with us today and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me today, David. Of course. So to kickstart the conversation, maybe you could just tell us about your journey to your current position role. Where did it start? How did you get where you are today? Um, share that story with us, please. Thank you. Thanks again for, for having me. So um, it all started in the Netherlands. So um, born and raised in, in Amsterdam. So um, um, my name and my accent, I guess, are not from the US. So that's where it all started. Studied there, uh, lived there most of my life. Um, then lived, uh, moved to Asia, lived a number of years in, in, in Vietnam and Singapore, um, after which I moved to South America. I uh, was fortunate to, to live a few years in Buenos Aires, Argentina, mm-hmm. um, and also traveled extensively across um, Latin America, uh, and then moved to the U.S. Uh, here in Chicago, so calling in here today uh, from a beautiful summer day in, uh, in the Chicagoland area um, eight years ago, give or take. I've num- have done a number of things um, in the real estate uh, uh, space. Um, but currently, I'm a managing partner here at, at the PropTech uh, Connection. Right. So specifically now, you're in that that cross-section of commercial real estate and technology. What did you do previous that led you to this particular position or or or, or provided that ex- expertise to be able to be part of this new organization? Yeah, super. So we, we saw a number of, of challenges in market and um, together with my colleagues, business partners, we, we saw a huge opportunity in this um, prop tech uh, space and, and commercial is, is, is one of the largest uh, parts of, of that. But as a, as, a, as a firm, we operate across every asset class and, and, and across the full asset life cycle. Um, but a lot of our work uh, concentrates around the commercial space. Um, but what we saw in market is um, a lot of um, noise. Um, lots of companies doing similar things, very hard for what we call technology buyers. Um, so REITs, asset owners, managers, operators, construction companies, et cetera, to actually understand what is happening in market on, in the tech space, right? Who is active? What companies are out there? What are the different models? Who is winning where, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what we are quite unique um, is, is a few things. One, uh, our team comes from the industry. So um, colleagues that worked in the VC space, uh, ex private equity, uh, uh, clean tech fund. Uh, we have a chartered accountant, ex investment banker, head of data analytics of one of the largest REITs. Um, and then collectively, as a firm, we have now interviewed three and a half thousand prop techs. We're tracking 19,000 uh, of them in, in different capacities. So, you know, we sat in every seat on the table. Um, mm-hmm. And myself, I've sold into uh, real estate businesses. I have an extensive network um, in that space. And, and what we do now is um, we also present a lot of our insights um, to some of events, for example. Uh, we've done some guest lectures here at MIT and Harvard, and uh, we're now speaking to Columbia University to get um, uh, to do one there as well. I was actually speaking with one of the professors last week. Uh, but we're really that independent vehicle that sits in that ecosystem that gives global market intelligence and insights what's happening in the space. And um, yeah, so we're, we're very unique, uniquely uh, positioned. And we have a very data-led infrastructure, how we map this and you know where we see the opportunities. So everything we do is is, is very much data-led. Um, and we leverage some of the platforms um, to deliver those insights um, um, to our clients. How many years into this process are you now? Um, in the PropTech connection, yeah. we're now uh, six years um, oh. in, in the business. And you know, the challenge is initially, it's like, okay, who are these guys, right? You need to, we're not a McKinsey, we're not a BCG. Um, um, so that's that's one of the first hurdles you you get. But what we're seeing now is we work with a lot of VC funds, obviously prop tech funds. We have visibility over two thousand eight hundred funds that have deployed in the prop tech space. At least what we define prop tech, 
Um, and um, that's a lot of strategics, family offices, and you know, uh, big, big uh, Fortune One Thousands, for example. Um, and um, yeah, th- 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 there is a big opportunity in in in, in this uh, in this particular space, and it's it's rapidly moving as well. Right. So, Evo, a two part question. Uh, one, I would love to know why you think you were so uniquely suited to this opportunity. What has helped to make you successful? But I can't ignore the timing. You know, you indicated you had launched about six years ago. So, you know, myself included, having launched just before the pandemic without a line of sight to the pandemic. I'm just curious, how has that affected your business and sort of the timing of how uh, the business has grown? Yeah, um, thank you for the questions. Um, maybe to answer question number uh, one, uh, uh, why me? Um, I, d- I don't think it's necessarily only me. It's it, it's, it's a team effort. But what 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 really um, um, started to 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 appear is that a lot of uh, folks in the network, um, technology buyers, these adopters that we that I was referring to, um, were looking into technology, um, and many didn't know where to start. Right, so that wasn't a good market intelligence um, network kind of vehicle that was facilitating data-led insights to in, into this ecosystem. That was the opportunity. And then um, where where I and, and our team really differentiates is that we have sat in every seat on that table. So we worked for funds. So we sat in the private equity VC site. We worked for REITs and construction companies on the adopter site. Um, and then we collectively interviewed three and a half thousand uh, prop tech. So we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, and then it was also timing, right? I and mean, you have to overlay its data, its network, and its knowledge, right? So all these things need to come together because it's a hard, right? Building an advisory business uh, it generally is, is hard. Building a name, reputation, and obviously um, 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 translating that into to business. And um, so, yeah, th- that has worked re- uh, worked out really well. And then, secondly, I think to what you said about um, the real estate market post COVID. Um, materially, this ecosystem has obviously changed, right? The way we consume real estate post-COVID is, is completely different, especially in commercial. If you look in terms of occupancy, depending on which market or where you are, there's a lot of nuance, right? But uh, generally speaking, in the US, obviously, there is stress in market, right? You see duration of, of lease terms is, is falling as well. Um, and, and then one of our observations is also that, you know, this model of the, 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 the regular B2B model, is shifting into a more B two B two C kind of model, where you know where the tech and the data needs for for these uh, technology buyers are shifting, right? So previously we're selling into uh, KPMG at, at, at Hudson Yard or whatever asset it may be, um, right? But but nowadays you actually need to understand these employees, right? What education do they have, and um, where they come from, backgrounds, right? The more granular, the better you know that the better insight you have about and predict when they come, how long they will stay, how long they stay with the job, et cetera, right? So the, the, the tech needs are, are really, really shifting and we see that. And we believe also as a um, as a firm that, you know, um, really say it as, uh, as it used to be, right? The traditional business is going to change, right? And you cannot stay behind from a tech perspective. So you need to be ahead of the game. If not, you're going to get out of business, right? So we, we think this tech involvement is going to be more and more material. And that's also based on some of the conversations, David, that we're having with, with folks in market. Um, tech innovation is uh, being more discussed in, in board meetings, right? So you really see that shift, I would say, over the last years. Yeah. Um, you know, I started this podcast just in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and it was, you know, a way to reach out and connect with people. And I was super interested in this whole conversation around what would eventually be uh, the future of work and how and where people work. Um, so today I'm just really excited to be engaging in conversation around the future of commercial real estate um, and how it's continuing to evolve to meet the needs of people. And then obviously to your point about the impact of technology and how that is not only enhancing how buildings are operated, but also the, the experience that is now offered as a result of that. So I'm super excited to be having this conversation with you and to be able to learn from that that network and that exposure that you bring to the to the table. So just curious if you could share with our listeners, you know, as your business is continuing to evolve, we're now through the worst of COVID, we, we are in a new world, um, doesn't look at all like the one, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, how is, you know, what kinds of things are you thinking about as you continue to innovate to meet the needs of, I guess, your stakeholders, which are, you know, building operators, prop tech companies, 
venture capital partners. Um, what kinds of things are you know influencing the way your business is evolving? Yeah, I think uh, it's it's a few things, and uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of new ones on market, right? So when we look, for example, we're a global business. We have five offices, three of which are in Asia, uh, Europe, and and here in the US. So we really have a global footprint, right? And and the needs of these three different buckets of clients are very different, right? So um, I, I think it's it's important. Maybe we can double down more here in the North American market. Sure. Um, but what what I think is 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 really prevalent is a few things. I would say one, um, you start to see that a lot of REITs, right, um, here in the US or technology buyers. Again, you know, it's di- different uh, pockets of of of, of companies um, are have a lot of capital to deploy, right? And and they're looking into how to stay ahead of the game. So tech budgets are increasing. Um, there's a lot of options out in market. Um, and you know we think that it's very hard for folks to find qualified staff to make those decisions, right? So um, having some kind of intelligence platform that can facilitate that, we think is really prevalent. Secondly, we start to see that a lot of the REITs are setting up direct investment arms, so corporate VCs, right? And they are looking for um, uh, strategic opportunities. And we think this is incredibly relevant uh, for a lot of the prop techs because- right. If, if a major read has a, a specific uh, issue, um, it's, it's very compelling, right? Because they don't only invest, but they also can become one of your largest clients, right? So having that, and we, we see that actually accelerating because it's very hard. If you're a prop tech VC, it's very hard to service 50, 60, 100 different LPs, all with different businesses, construction companies, commercial, um, uh, engineering groups, whatever it may be, but they have all different use cases, different problems, right? So what may work for them might not work for the guy next door, right? So there's a lot of curation. So we we, we see that um, um, as well. And then, you know, what, what we also see is that, you know, let's say create a office space is very hot, right? So obviously also right. the, the the guys, the, the space where you guys uh, play, um, there's an increasing need for tech, even though, you know, we need to zoom out and, and understanding obviously the inflationary environment and you know um a pressure on budgets etc but i think if you look on a log chart if you zoom out and you see the trend there is a very strong desire from players in market to come in and then the final piece i would say is there is a lot of um fortune 1000s looking into this prop tech domain as well so one of the things you know what we're thinking about is a lot of these becoming more and more prevalent or likely that tech companies will become real estate businesses. So this is also something that we're thinking through and the impact that will have on, on the sector. I'm just curious from the, the, the perspective of strategic investment, um, just a sidebar question. Do you think, what, what do you think the implications are for an early stage startup when they um, do receive strategic investment? Does that positively, negatively influence their trajectory um, does it limit them? Does it open up doors for them? You know, is there any bias if and when that happens? What, like, I think it's very an interesting proposition for you know the the industry to actually make that that actual investment. But is, you know, for the prop tech company, good good, bad, or indifferent? Uh, it depends. Um, maybe not the answer you want to hear, but I would say it really right. depends on the on the entity, uh, both on the on the startup, the prop tech side, as well as the investor side. Um, sometimes it's very smart money. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's not smart money, right? So it, it really depends because there's a few challenges. One, right, is um, oftentimes or sometimes taking strategic capital closes doors from competitors that you know will not right. engage because you know Mr. Right. A has an upside, right, and is invested in the space. So you need to be very wary of that. On the other side, one of our clients is a major corporate VC. At, uh, out of Japan, for example, they write you know very small checks up until they can buy what, for whatever price effectively, um, and for them they have you know they're active in real estate, energy, and across a lot of different industries, um, and they can plug that in in a lot of and because of the scale they're actually not competing because you know anything right. is irrelevant. Those are very interesting. We're working now with a major investor in Saudi that has very strategic needs. What they're looking for, this is extremely compelling for any mm-hmm. prop tech that you would approach because one, they have no access to Saudi, they're not there. If they come instantly, you become the largest player in market. So that's very compelling. But mm-hmm. you know, there is there is sometimes um, uh, competition. Another thing I think what we see with, with, with corporate VCs is 
um, decision making processes are uh, slower, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different stakeholders that need to get involved, um, more due diligence, depending who they are, not necessarily the domain experts in the prop tech space, right? Um, and that's why we sometimes work with those folks because you know say, hey, listen, we don't know this space entirely. You know, we need some support here, uh, but that obviously means then that they need to get more comfort to make some of those decisions, right? So those right. where whereas a, a traditional VC can move faster, and oftentimes, you know, when when folks are looking for funding, uh, speed speed is a very important um, 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 consideration. Um, so Evo, I've got to tap into your 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 broad exposure to a global industry and just ask you about. The office category, the office space, because that's obviously where we're clearly focused. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are your um, clients telling you about how you know space is being utilized, and more importantly, how maybe the purpose of space is changing or evolving, and how they're responding? No, very, very good question, uh, uh, David, and, and obviously you can share a, a lot of knowledge in, in this particular uh, domain. But I'll try my best to to answer it. I think. Um, if we look here in the North American market, um, you know, this provision of space and, and how to use it is obviously uh, something that a lot of folks are trying to figure out. From our perspective, there is 13 different strategies that you can implement as a commercial owner, right? In terms of, you know, how you want to position that asset and, and put yourself in market, right? And, and one of the, the key things where we see a lot of demand and, and where there's um, uh, still a lot of demand from, from the tenant side is... Um, um, high quality amenity driven assets, right? right. Um, and that's also what you see now is the Black Rocks and, and the Blackstones and some of the largest institutional owners are buying, are coming in, right? So this also means that likely the bottom is in, right? These guys, right. the smartest folks in the market are, are very active. Um, but it's something, you know, we, we have a lot of um, conversations uh, behind doors and, and people and trying, trying to um, map this out and really trying to understand um, how to do it, but it's really from from a from an ownership perspective. What are your KPIs? What are your objectives? What are you trying to achieve? And then, factually, back solving that to the tech needs, right? How, how can you facilitate uh, that? Very different kind of uh, conversations, I would say, that we have in in mostly the US and and and, and Asia. Uh, Europe is a whole other other beast, but that's why we see um, um, most of those um, discussions being held. Right. Uh, a bit of a forward-thinking question. You're managing director of the PropTech Connection Global Footprint. Uh, you're you're still building your business. You're six years in, but still lots of runway ahead of you. Um, if you uh, if budget were not an issue, if I was able to give you a blank check, um, and you're thinking about how to build this business for the next three to five years, um, I'm just curious, what new initiatives would you love to undertake uh, to position your business for success to be able to continue to respond to this evolving industry? Oh, that's a, that's a <laughs> hypothetical question. But I think what we would do, we would probably hire 100 or 200 data scientists. Right. Um, and I think the real opportunity here is um, what we've done as a business, we're tracking 19,000 prop techs. We have a 200 data point analysis, how we look at each tech company. So we map 10 million data points in the space. So we think we have the most robust market intelligence platform uh, on that. And you can start building auto, uh, algorithms on top of that. And then you can start automating certain things. And we think then you have a very powerful engine where you can look at, let's say, use case stack offering and build another 70, 80 different filters behind it. And then with a very high degree of confidence can start automated matchmaking. And we think that's very powerful because, you know, um, a lot of people waste a lot of time in this space, right? One of the challenges we see when we speak with um, tech buyers is, you know, say, hey, listen, everybody's coming to me. Everybody wants obviously to sell a product. I don't know who's selling the truth. I don't know what's out in the market. So there's a lot of wasted time, right? right. Um, and then good companies sometimes don't get the credibility because somebody is really good in doing marketing and PR, right? But then oversells and then, you know, it becomes a bad reputation that then goes back to the entire industry. So if we got a blank check, um, that's where we would spend um, uh, a lot of time uh, and effort. And uh, quite frankly, what I think is also interesting, if you look at almost every industry in the world, there's a market leader, right? Somebody, right. there's a leading brand. In real estate, you don't really have it. There is no go-to platform for real estate. Yes, you have CBRE. Yes, you have JLL. Um, but but I think there is an opportunity for somebody to become that go-to brand. And that could actually come from the tech side, right? So there's 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 also an opportunity we, we see there. I love it. Very aspirational. Um, I'm just finishing an amazing book called Unreasonable Hospitality. 
um, written by a um, an entrepreneur in the restaurant business, where obviously hospitality is key. But I just think there's there's so much to be learned for any business. Um, and so for me, uh, it just highlighted what what I've been thinking about for quite some time. This whole notion of you know how we create destinations of choice, how we up the experience to you know to to instill a desire to be back in the physical workplace you know we don't believe in mandates we really believe that people need to come back because they want to be there they choose to be yep. there um so i'm just curious as you're talking with you know the real estate industry and prop tech companies obviously we are specific to the tenant experience um you know conversation but what other you know how else is that playing out from your observation what other you know what other requests are coming either from the industry or what other prop tech companies are emerging, not just only in tenant experience, but in, in other spaces that are trying to address this whole issue of experience? Yeah, I think um, what, what, uh, what, what we generally see in market, there is a lot of um, point solutions. What you're starting to see is that um, a lot of folks that, you know, middleware aggregators, platforms that bring that together um, are building a lot of momentum, right? Clients are looking for a one-stop shop, bringing that all um, and um, so, so that's one thing where we see a lot of um, interest. Um, I think we need to also zoom out, right? There's different things that we see in the US here. It's very much uh, transactional driven, right? A lot of tech coming into that domain, like lots of transactions. How can we make that more efficient, lower the cost? In Europe, it's very much that um, um, ESG sustainability agenda, right? Where mm -hmm. regulatory, you know, like New York is leading in the US, but that, that conversation is a bit more, progress right also from a regulatory uh, standpoint and an apex is a whole other whole other uh, beast where you have you know um emerging markets developed markets and, and the tech needs are very very different um so i think that's that's what we see 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 macro but it's really you know who is bringing that together right those middleware platforms we think is a is a really big opportunity right um let's take a short commercial break and we'll be right back to continue the conversation this episode of 10 is proudly brought to you by Hilo. Hilo is a rapid deployment workplace engagement platform for the hybrid world that enables building operators to connect to their tenants, whether they're at work, at home, or anywhere in between. We are in the midst of a seismic shift in the evolution of the workplace. Now more than ever, it's clear that the most important asset of a building is the people. Commercial real estate leaders recognize that tenants and employees want new kinds of spaces, services, and amenities to support having the flexibility to work from anywhere. Workplace engagement solutions that connect hybrid working people to buildings no matter where they are have become a major differentiator as buildings compete to retain current tenants and attract new ones. Hilo empowers building operators to meet this challenge. To learn more about Hilo and schedule a demo, visit hiloapp.com. And I'd like to welcome back to the show, Evo Van Brooklyn, Managing Partner at the PropTech Connection. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for um, having me. Yes. Uh, listen, you are at the forefront of this disruption of the largest asset class in the world, commercial real estate, you know, being introduced, in, sorry, impacted by just, you know, so many new technology solutions. When I first um, envisioned what has now become Hilo, Back in 2017, you know, I went to my first tech conference, and I think there were about 100 people in the audience, um, and probably you know just a few more hundred, you know, prop tech companies uh, across the, the 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 spectrum of, of of geographies. And now you said you're tracking some, I think 19,000. So um, that's a huge number and a lot of growth over a short period of time. So with the introduction of all this new technology and the role that it's playing in terms of operations and efficiency and experience just curious about any thoughts you have on that whole tech stack um you know what what are you you hearing most from your real estate partners as to what they're looking for um it always trickles down to a few questions how um can i make more money at the end of the day it's all about roi right so what we see in market is there's a lot of questions and, and discussions about hey why is x not using tech and you know at the end of the day it's like how can you increase asset value how can you reduce costs or save me time right at the bottom mm -hmm. line that's where it gets through so that's also how we look at it so um folks tend to come to us with you know use cases or specific commercial problems that they're trying to solve and then we have a very methodological approach in terms of how we look at that but the reality is that's where it comes down to right, right. so 
Um, and what you see then also from obviously relationships and conversations that we have is there is also um, um, large real estate organizations that, for example, have tried to build a tenant engagement app themselves. We know of of one in, in Asia that spent $10 million building out themselves. And I think six people wow. have used it, right? And and there was, you know, one of folks that was very much involved in this that led to, um, that was very excited to build this initiative. Um, whereas, you know, would have made much more sense to actually go to a vendor that already built it, right? And you can plug in tomorrow. And and now it's, you know, just just a lot of money is is effectively drain, drained away, right? So I think, um, um, yeah, th- those are some of the things that we're uh, seeing, uh, David. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's been this tension, and certainly in the early days, and 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 still in some companies, even from what we hear, this notion of building within or partnering with a you know a solution or or a company like ours. You know, and I think what we have to appreciate is that it doesn't. Maybe it's not as easy as it looks. Um, and I think if we want best in class. Um, you know, I think it's fair to assume that a best-in-class real estate operator is not necessarily going to be a best-in-class technology provider. Um, so, you know, I think the best of the, you know, the, what's best for all of us is for us to, you know, play in our own arena, play in, play in the areas that where we can truly excel, and then, you know, come together in a meaningful way that's going to help grow all of our respective businesses. I love how you zeroed in on ROI, that ultimately there's got to be a business case. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that we think a lot about, and we're always striving to be able to better articulate and better yep. demonstrate. Um, um, so I think that's a great insight and, and, and a great observation for other players in the market. Um, our closing speed round, Evo, is an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better on a personal level. So I'm just curious, looking back, uh, if you, there was one piece of advice that you wish someone had given you when you were first starting in your career, what might that be? Ooh, that's one that I really need to think about. I think. <laughs> um, I think ambition and um, relentless pursuit of success is really important, right? Mm-hmm. So the space where you guys work, it's really hard, right? Building a tech business. It's really hard. It, 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 it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily see it, right? The, the amount of thinking that goes into building that, I think it is really, really important. And then I think secondly, I, everybody should always start earlier. And um, I, I think that's two and three, um, one should really think about investment partners, what the right time is. We always say to try to delay it as much as you can and, mm-hmm. and, and only do it um, when you need it. That's great advice. Uh, certainly on the investment side, you know, some people, uh, the press release goes out when they raise a round and they think that's a win. Um, and personally, I, I, I uh, align with those that will tell you that, you know, the win is when you grow your business. The win is not just taking on more um, investment. Um, yep, that's I a agree. means to an end and it's the end that you should be celebrating. So um, I agree in terms of delaying. And I also think in terms of who, it, how much and when ultimately. Yep. Um, tell me, share with me one way in which technology uh, has impacted or improved the way you live or work. Well, uh, for me, um, I always like to mention this. I've, I've worked from home the last 10 years, give or take 10, 15 years. So when this entire thing of COVID happened, everybody was like, oh, what's happening? I was like, for me, nothing ha- nothing yeah. materially changed in terms of I was already doing it, right? Obviously, I couldn't go out of the house, et cetera. So um, I, I think, you know, that, that that's really exciting. But what, what I think a lot of people underestimate is that this concept of, um, you know, all these different technologies, right, that are now coming together, start, you know, come uh, colliding, right? If you look in terms of blockchain and you look at AI, you know, you start, how did this all going to grow? I think a lot of people underestimate, we're used to exponential growth, uh, sorry, to linear growth, not to exponential growth. Mm-hmm. And I think what's going to happen in the upcoming four, five, six years is is um, something we're not ready for. You know, we cannot mentally, it's, it's really hard to see that. And also for me, it's really hard, but the, the pace at which things change is just incredibly fast. Right. And I think it's going to increase. I think that's a great observation. Um, as commercial real estate continues to evolve, I think a lot about sort of the, the skills, the roles, the responsibilities of people at the operational level, um, people who are operating real estate. And I think the way that it was, and I think a lot about the way that it's going to be. And I really feel that the needs and the skills are going to change. Just as you said, you know, tech is going to, their exponential growth. Um, 
we th- yeah, I think there's going to be new kinds of people working in our industry, which I think is going to be very exciting. I'm just curious. Do you, have you thought about that at all? Have you heard you know, have you heard that from other people in the industry? And, and if so, what what expertise or skills do you think are going to be required? Um, we've we've done some thinking around it. I think it's going to be data scientists. These are going to be mm-hmm. the best paid people in the industry. Right. And two, right. it's it's about uh, obtaining data sets. I think those are the two things where, um, you know, where there is going to be a lot of demand and where yeah. there is the biggest opportunity as well. It's really trying to understand all the data, how to bring that together and then mm-hmm. pull the extra insights from it to, to monetize on it. That's right. Uh, the, you know, the data without the analysis is not going to be helpful long term. No. Um, if you were not doing what you're doing right now, what would you be doing instead? I hope I would be laying on a beach somewhere in the, <laughs> in the Caribbean. Um, uh, no, but I would always be, um, um, I have a lot of ideas and other things that I would like to do, right? So um, um, maybe there's a lot of different things that cross my mind and, and, and things that I would do, uh, but always entrepreneurial. Right. You've got that entrepreneur. I, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I get that. Uh, and it's in our DNA. Uh, Evo, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. I really enjoyed the conversation. I'm looking forward to continuing uh, to engage with you and your team um, and continue to collaborate. And uh, I hope this is just the first of that process, in, in, the first step in that process. So thanks again for joining me today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed All it. All right, Evo. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wrap on today's episode of 10. I want to thank Evo for joining me on the program. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. It helps others find the show. Thanks for listening. And until next time, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work and live.